Oh, I just I scratch my back here. Just get a little bit of a scratch. Yeah, we just got an itch right there. Look at, oh yeah, wow, it's good. Oh, it's, oh, it's so good. Oh, good Lord. Oh, holy smokes. Oh, oh, just, oh yeah. We can really get in there. Oh, can you guys feel that like I can? Oh, okay, back to sleep. Okay, all right. All right, dudes and Judas. It is a stressful yet exciting day out. All right, so today we're gonna to be going over a small group of animals with only four in the family, and that is gonna be the anteaters. Let me get her attention here first. Mama, big mama, do this. Yeah, get that. I'm gonna give the baby to my baby over here real quick. So we have a mom and a baby, Tamandua. So this is how it goes. We have four species of Tamandua, all are in the, and I'm gonna to have to refer even myself to the names here because all the scientific names are really hard to pronounce. Whenever you look at something, you have your domain, your domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, and suborder. The suborder of these guys is vermilingua. So vermilingua means worm tongue. I'm pretty sure, yeah, worm tongue. And this is all off of Wikipedia. This is easy information to get. Um, the research that I did, for the last like five weeks on these guys has been in great detail. A lot of the names are hard to deal with. That's why I'm gonna use some of this here, which is kind of cheating, but don't blame me. Now, what she's eating right now is a gruel mix. We have a specific diet. You guys have seen Kiwi on Facebook. We haven't done a full episode on her on the uh, YouTubes, but this is not Kiwi. This is another mom and another baby, and we're gonna bring out a third one here in just a minute. So for these guys, we have the giant anteater, which most people know, that's like way bigger than this. Then we have the lesser anteater, which is the tamanduas. I call them tamanduas. They say that the right way to pronounce it is tamandua. So tamanduas or tamanduas, say it however you want. It doesn't bother me one bit, still means the same thing. But they all have that long face, uh, kind of like the pangolins. A lot of people think they're related. Aardvarks, they get called a lot too, and you know, into like relation status or whatever. But there, there's only four. We have the silky, we have the tamanduas, the northern and southern, and then we also have, like I said, the giant anteater. Now these tamanduas here, and I'm glad she's eating because last night we did the actual food. Oh my God, I'm wearing ridiculous Crocs and socks for this episode. <laughs> So last night we got these guys and uh, I stress easy. I stress very easy when it comes to any animals because we, have to, we want them to be good. So we have a little baby and we have mom. Mom is still feeding this baby and the baby's probably eating on its own as well. Here, go ahead, hold this in front of her and see if the little baby will take some of that too. So I have a diet mix that is extremely formulated. Just put the little head up here and let her snot. Just like that, see if she wants it. She probably doesn't because she probably just wants mommy's milk. Let's see. You gonna take any? Here, give me that back so you don't spill it. So you just hang out with baby. She's got a big old fat belly because she's been milking on mom. So this little girl is probably about three months old, four months old. Mom, we have no idea, but I'm glad to see her eating even though this is not the food that I want her to be eating. I'm gonna offer this as well which is a little bit of cat food, which is protein. What I feed kiwi is extremely different. When you actually go into the research of these guys, and I've went into the research so deep that I don't even know where to start and where to begin as far as what to teach you guys, because a lot of it was hard for me to retain, so if I just spit out all these facts, it's gonna be difficult for you to retain as well. But they did studies back in the day, and this was in Brazil, where these guys do come from. So there was five zoos in Brazil that did studies. They would take in what they would call nuisance animals. This is a species of least concern, so they're abundant in the wild, so we do have that um, as a good thing. Like these guys aren't critically endangered. I don't think we're um, at a, even a point where they're gonna be vulnerable, but they were extremely hard to care for in captivity. So they would get these nuisance anteaters. Look how cute that little thing is. I know, I'm gonna oh zoom goodness. real quick. Oh my goodness, oh. this is gonna be a hard episode to get through. So, um, I don't even know what I was talking about anymore. Thanks, little baby. So the five zoos in Brazil, they would get animals that were nuisance caught. And when they would get these nuisance caught animals, they would bring them in and they would try to formulate a diet with uh, tamanduas, tamanduas, however you want to say it, giant anteaters, and the other species that we're gonna bring out that's far less known. 
uh, which looks like a creepy little Muppet that got fired from a TV show. We're gonna bring that out last. Those guys, nobody really knew how to basically formulate a diet that was gonna meet all of these guys' uh, dietary needs. And the reason is, is because 94% of their diet is about 10 species of ants. 6% of that diet is gonna be termites one season is in for termites. So how do you replace a bunch of food that, you know, we're talking about an animal like this would eat upwards of 9,000 ants per day. The little guy that we're gonna bring out last would eat probably 3,500 ants a day. That is an extreme amount of ants to consume in one day. And something that's really cool about these guys is that they don't have any teeth. They have a huge tongue, and that tongue, like for the adults, is coming out at like maybe, maybe like a foot, 11 inches. So it's a huge tongue, and it's built to get into ant nests, termite nests, the whole nine yards. They have those big, huge claws in the front, and they have to walk on their sides when they're on the ground so that they don't poke their own pads. So the pads of their feet are extremely rough and callous. They are kind of like ours if, you know, somebody's like a, an outdoor worker, shovel all day long, all that good stuff. Your hands are gonna be a little bit more rough. That's kind of what their pads feel like, and I'm saying that for you, Darshna, because you asked. But the claws, um, the little one's sharp, the big one's kind of sharp, but the amount of pressure that they can put is extreme. If I put this girl on a tree, it would take two to three people to get her off the tree if she doesn't want to come off the tree. And I'm talking about, you can have a three foot wide tree. They could be fully spread out with their legs and feet sitting on there. And they also have this prehensile tail. You see the fur goes from the front and starts to fade towards the back. And that's because they can use this as a digit. It's 100% prehensile. Prehensile meaning that it can fold itself around and use it as a digit. So these guys are extremely strong, extremely powerful. Um, for the size of the animal, you would never guess that it could put out the kind of power that it puts out. And she's actually extremely sweet. The baby's even sweeter. I'll get her in a second here. Actually, she's probably looking for mama. Here, put her on the floor real quick and see if she goes to mama. Watch this. A loving relationship. So she's got her baby. She's okay. She's not going to do nothing to you. So back into what I was saying, she's got the pencil tail. They have these back feet. They have those claws in the front. And they have that one huge claw. And that's for climbing in trees. So these guys are semi-arboreal, but they're also terrestrial. These guys, the anteaters, the tamanduas, and the giant anteaters will mainly stay on the forest floor, but these guys too will operate in the trees as well. The one that we're gonna bring out next, I'll tell you about in a minute, that guy's gonna stay in the trees pretty much his whole life. So these guys are on the floor and in the forest, the large ones being on the floor all the time, they can do that because they are a little bit bigger. They do have the fence, which is those big claws in front of their face. You can get some of that cat food now. Now again, I'll go into the diet in a second. Oh, Ooh, you dirty, dirty little girl. You're so dirty. Oh, goodness. And this is one of the, oh, you're gonna stomp that everywhere. This is one of the huge problems with the anteaters and Kiwi does this even more so than her. I'm surprised that she was so sweet with that diet because Kiwi literally, when I put her diet out there, I have to put it in a giant tub because she'll knock that bowl over and immediately start digging in there to get what she wants. So she'll spill it all over the place. So I put that big, huge tub in there so that when she spills it, she can get the rest of her diet. She's gonna probably go right in that box over there to tuck up. These guys are pretty much nocturnal. They're gonna be out cruising out during the nighttime, during the day. Let me see the baby for a minute. During the day, these guys are gonna be curled up in a tree. Usually they'll hollow out a tree trunk. They can do that themselves if they want to, or they'll find a hollowed out tree trunk and they'll sit in there all day long, usually coming out right at about evening time and starting to scan um, around nighttime. So these guys are found all over the place in uh, South America, all the way even up into uh, Mexico. The Southern Tamandua is Tamandua tetradactylus, I think. And the Northern Tamandua is Tamandua mexicana. Here, you could take her if you want, mama. And then just show them and I'll keep talking. Let me go ahead and find the phone just so I can tell you the exact names here. Um, yeah, Southern Tamandua or the Collard Tamandua is Tamandua tetradactyla and the Northern Tamandua is the Mexicana. So Mexicana, so they go all the way almost up into Mexico over there, but it's a huge range when you think about this stuff. And then they're gonna be cru uh, cruising the Oh God, let me just take a second here and regain my thoughts. I need like some sleep. 
So they'll cruise the forest floor and they can live in all types of different habitats all across South America. And they can do the rainforest, they can do savanna areas, they can do flatlands, they can do all kinds of stuff. And they do very well and they adapt very well. I was actually reading something of one in China that was in a zoo that escaped and they tracked it after like two months and actually adapted to being in China with these ants. Now to go into what they eat, like I said, 94, are we doing Simba? Yeah. Let him cuddle on you so he's comfy. All right, so... With these guys here, the way they eat, with it, their diet being 94% ants and that 6% termites, they don't have any teeth in there. There's no teeth, it's just that huge tongue. And what's interesting is the way that it works, you gotta think, they're eating a bunch of ants, right? Carpenter ants, they're eating worker ants, a bunch of ants that will bite and hurt. So they have that thick fur, but the trick is, is what they'll do, is they'll go to an ant nest or a termite nest, they spend a couple of minutes, They'll tear into it with their big claws and then they move on and go to a next, uh, another nest. And they keep doing that over and over and over again. And there's two reasons for that. They'll have a territory that's like maybe a, uh, a square mile, maybe two square miles, and they'll continue to run that habitat in that area. These guys are solitary animals. So eventually these guys will go out with kiwi and we're gonna have to watch real close. Now kiwis used to living with animals. These guys are used to living with other ones. So I think they'll be fine but we're gonna find out real quick, but they are solitary in the wild, except for when it's mating season. And even when it's mating season, there's no passion involved, ladies and gentlemen. These guys will literally link up, mate, it's not a passionate event. And then the baby, one baby will come a little bit farther along. In the future gestation period, I would have to go back in to look at, I've got so much information in my brain about these guys, it's ridiculous. Let me go back to the tongue. So eating that many ants, and there's two reasons why they do, the, the slow crawl at the nest and then do that for two minutes and then move to another nest and do that for a couple of minutes and there's the two reasons for this. Number one, even though they have thick fur and thick skin that helps them with the ant bites, so they will catch a couple of ant bites, but they move on quickly so they don't get torn up by a whole bunch of ants. You gotta imagine if you're in an ant nest and you're sticking your face in there, you're gonna catch some bites. So for that reason, they hit it and move on quickly, but they also do that so that they can consistently come back to the same spots in the same area so they can consistently um, eat uh, plenty of food. So those nests will stay. This thing's burying his head just like he's gonna bury his head in mama. So these things will literally stay um, in that same two square mile. Oh, you're, you're so cute, oh my goodness. They'll, they'll stay in that two square mile territory and they constantly can go back to those same nests to keep feeding because the ants are reproducing, the nests don't get teared up, uh, torn apart 100%. So there's always food around. So that's the two reasons for that. But you gotta think if they're eating that many ants, how does their stomach handle that? And it's very simple. With his tongue as long as it is, as they're taking in ants, there's little barbs on it. So it's perfect for grabbing little ants and taking it back into the mouth. And as it's going into the back of the throat, into the stomach, it's actually grinding those ants on the way down. So the tongue goes out, the ants get stuck on it, and on the way down, it's grinding, grinding, grinding. So they don't have to worry about the insect tearing them apart from the inside out. Cause you can imagine eating 9,000 ants a day is gonna probably be wicked on your tummy if you're not chewing those guys up. And being that these guys don't have any teeth, that's the easiest way for them to deal with that. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put this little baby back with mama. And I'm gonna put it back with mama, you're gonna hold the other one. And then we're gonna bring out another special animal in this family. And the suborder, like I said, is the, the worm tongue word, but the class is mammalia, so it's a mammal. And then, um, go back. yes, give her to mama, go ahead. Gentle, and then just go over there and put it right with mama. Watch this, guys, this is awesome. And they have free room of everything, but these guys like to be squeezed up tight. I'll take a video of Kiwi, and I'll pop it in right now. What you doing, woman? I built you a box. You just like it on the side of your box. A little upside down with some honey. Come on up for some honey. Get your, get your big butt out of there. Get your big butt out of there. Huh? You silly girl. So you could see, obviously, that I built the nest box for Kiwi and she chooses to stay on the side of the nest box where she's squished in. 
So even this box here probably wouldn't be tight enough for them. They like to feel confined. They like to feel squeezed into the space. Get in there and watch mommy clean up the baby. So right now mommy's doing what every other mommy would do. The baby's constantly gonna be clean, so we haven't seen any feces yet. And this is the first time I've actually gotten her to eat. So I'm gonna go back to the diet right now. The diet for these guys, like I feed kiwi, is very, very involved. And there's a reason for that. Too much high fat content is gonna lead to that binding with calcium, which basically means that the calcium is not metabolized correctly. And if it's not, look at that tongue, boom. She put it out for everybody. So the calcium doesn't get metabolized correctly. Look, babies are suckling on mom. Right to mama. And mama's doing a good job. Probably no. happy. Not right now. Let the, let the baby eat and then we'll give her some sugars. So, uh, look, you can hear it too. Whoa, it's so cute. It's so cute. So the diet that I have for kiwi is extremely formulated to meet their needs. Like too much fat, like I was saying, that binds with the calcium. It doesn't met metabolize correctly. They can go into wasting disease. Uh, the bones kind of fall apart. Their fur will get really rough and they get super weak. So the diet has to be exact. If I were to go over all the percentages of all the vitamins and minerals and everything that we need for these animals, you guys would be just as confused as I was. So basically I read for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and we have this diet that's been created and used by zoos. Just go sit with that for a second and we'll reveal it in a minute. So it's been used by zoos all over the place um, as an accepted diet for these anteaters. What they're eating right now is basically a gruel mix. It's got a little bit of wet cat food in there. It's got um, Zoologic milk replacement, which I got from Rick, which is actually a really, really good milk replacement because instead of like Espelac or which is dog replacement milk or KMR, which is cat replacement milk. And they also have a bunch of other different milk replacements for certain animals, but this Zoologic milk matrix actually gives you a breakdown. So it says if I mix this many cups of the dry stuff with this much water, this is how much fat I'm gonna have, this is how much solids, this is how much of this, this is how much of this. So it gives me percentages and I'll go for a lower fat percentages because I want lean meat on these guys. I don't want a whole bunch of fat to block up that calcium so they don't have issues with their fur, their bones, their whole thing. But we want to slowly switch them over to the diet like we feed kiwi. The diet that we feed kiwi is insectivore from Missouri. And then along with that, uh, it's 32 cups of, of insecti uh, insectivore gel. So it's like a powder. So we put that, and then we do a third of a cup of Benebac, which is a probiotic for the animal. So it's got all these good probiotics, good belly stuff. And then we're gonna mix that with Nestum baby cereal, which is like a, a kid cereal. So you do a can and a half of that. And then we do 600 vitamin K1 pills ground up, and all of that goes into the mix. And this is food for like a month and a half, two months. It's not just, a couple of days worth of food. It's a whole dry mix that we use for a while. And then we add some Esplac in there, which is the dog milk, and that's gonna give them the folic acid they need, the iron they need, certain for percentages of minerals, vitamins, and all that other stuff. But we have to pay very close attention. Like I said, if I went over their percentages with you, it would confuse you just as much as it did me at first. But for months and months, I've been researching these guys to get ready for kiwi because I knew I was getting kiwi a long time ago. So once we get that dry diet, we basically mix that with one egg, a half an ounce of ground beef, a half a teaspoon of yogurt or curdled milk or anything like that. And then we do 7.5 ounces of hot water. So the diets look similar to what you're seeing here. This is just a different mix. There's a little papaya in here. There's that milk matrix that's in there that's actually really good. And then there's actually some, um, some little marmoset food that's in there as well, ground up, which has the crude protein and all the other stuff that they're gonna need. But again, I'm slowly gonna switch these guys over. This is what they've been being fed from where they come from. I'm gonna be switching them over to that zoo diet so that these guys can move forward and go on to their zoo home. And they're probably gonna go to a zoo here in Florida, but they can't go out of the state as well. They're not critically endangered, so they can cross state lines. But Josh with Cold-Blooded Kingdom, and if you guys haven't checked Josh out yet, if you're into reptiles, any reptiles, literally any reptiles, you should definitely go 
uh, to coldbloodedshop.com. They have literally anything you could possibly imagine. Tons of monitor species, all kinds of snakes, colubrids, you got uh, different pythons over there. You have all kinds of like just rarities, oddities, things that you don't normally see. And this guy is bringing them in and doing a phenomenal job. They do everything over there. They treat before anything goes out. So they do endo and ectoparasites. If needed, they do meds. They have a ton of meds over there, but they do everything properly. They do everything by the book. And they'll wait before an animal goes because number one, they don't want to send an animal out just the same as I don't send an animal out that's going to have a rough time or give somebody a rough time and then the animal pays the price. They want something healthy, happy to deliver out. So Josh and I have been talking for a while about kind of doing stuff like this so that we can provide zoos and large wildlife parks here in Florida and outside the state of Florida with incredible animals and rare animals as well. The next one I'm going to show you here is another little ant eater, but this is, this is in the Muppet family, I'm going to say. Suborder Muppets. So this guy here is in the same family as these guys. Come here, you little oh creature. Come here. Come here, come here, come here. But these guys are strong as well, and they do have the prehensiles. I'm going to give them to you in a second, okay, mama? Look at this little face. Rawr. Little. Rawr, 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 rawr. And oh, there's the defensive posture right here. Believe it or not, when you hold this one, it hurts worse than the big guys. Those claws, and you can see it matches their larger counterparts. This is the silky or pygmy anteater. I have seen one of these in my life when I was very young. This is the first time I've ever had the pleasure of working with one, and this is as big as it's gonna get, about a pound. So incredibly amazing. These guys also come from South America, but they're gonna be in the hottest parts of South America. We just gave this dude a bath yesterday. I might put some of those clips in there or we might do a separate video of giving this guy a bath because it does like a tight little spot like that cork bark. It too is going to be nocturnal and these guys in the wild don't live very long and the reason is they're super small, they're very slow, and they are anteaters. So this guy's going to take in about probably 2,000 to 3,000 ants a day, maybe 3,500 ants, but they can't go to the forest floor like the bigger guys can because they can't protect themselves. So if they go on the floor and try and hit those mounds, chances are a predator is going to come by, scoop this guy up, and eat it with no problems whatsoever. The, sharp, the claws are sharp. They can pinch. They can hurt, but that's about it. Again, no teeth, but you can see this guy seems to have even a bigger mouth than the larger counterparts. Those lips go all the way up to the back of the face. He's got a little derpy dirt face on there. Ra 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 ra. And just like the other ones, except for a little bit different, this one's more like a spider monkey. Look at this. So full fur on the tail, but on the bottom, nothing. And that is the extra digit. This thing can support full body weight with that. So you can hold on to a tree, whatever it needs to hold on to, and then you can move down, crawl down, and use those big, huge, sharp claws to get around. So these are tree dwellers, so all the ants they get come out of the tree. You wanna take them, Mama? You got an ant? He's not gonna eat your ant, Mama, I promise. So we're gonna try and see if this little guy will eat some of this gruel. Since this little dude, I think, ate a couple of mealworms the other night, which is not exactly what they need for it. You can't force them like that, Mama, here. I got it, there we go. Just let me smell it. This one's a little bit more shy than the other guys, so he's probably not gonna eat for us right here on camera. Maybe he will, I'm not sure. She will, they're all, they're all little girls, but probably not. Uh -uh. But we're going to, I have a bunch of this mix, and since the big girl ate it, chances are this little munchkin right here is gonna eat it too, but again, Super nocturnal, and this one's obviously gonna be a lot more shy because unlike the bigger counterparts over there, they don't have much to protect themselves except those little claws. They know it, they know what the deal is. We're big, scary animals. Don't move them around too much. Just let them cuddle, mama. All right, there, just snuggle, just like that. So these guys are a little bit more timid, a little bit more shy, but surprisingly enough, this one seemed to take to the regular ant eater diet a lot better than the others did. There was disturbed, stuff all around the bowl. There was a little bit less than we had put in there. So I think that guy did drink some 
and they all drink water great and on top there's the little snuggle mm -hmm. there you go looking just to get out of the day there you go nice little ball right there wrapping himself up with his tail now he's fully protected and that's how you would find him in the wild inside of a tree so extremely incredible animals all these guys the giant anteater the silky anteater the northern and southern Tamandua or Tamandua, however you want to say it, is fine with me, like I said, but these guys are extremely incredible animals. The research that I've done in the last however many weeks has been, or months, has been incredible. It's been a phenomenal learning experience to be able to care for these guys is amazing. Again, these guys go out with Kiwi out there, but we got to watch. Um, they basically had run of the room. They tend not to leave the box too much. Uh, we keep it open, and then at night they will crawl around a bit. But we wanted them separate for at least the first night to see if they were going to take to that diet. Because I know if I put a bunch of diets in there, Kiwi's going to go to each and every single one. She's going to dump it over, and then we don't know who ate what. So we're going to be introducing them probably later on. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to need a poop sample. We got some poop from this little guy, probably because he ate last night. Those guys didn't eat much of the diet. Now that she ate, she's probably going to poop. We don't get any poop from the baby because mommy is cleaning that up. But as soon as I get some poop from mom, I'm going to go ahead and slide that on a uh, little slide. I'm going to put it under my microscope, make sure nobody's got any parasites that we need to treat. And then we'll go for an introduction here. Look at this. Man, I, 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 maybe I should post some of the videos, or maybe we'll just do a separate one when we gave this thing a bath. It had little dingleberries, little uh, matted fur kind of all over the place. And then this morning, after we cleaned it up, gave it a bath, the whole nine yards. This morning I woke up, dingleberries, poop all over the place, poop inside the nails, fur inside the nails, and that's because he's constantly moving around in his poop, and or her poop, and doesn't really do a great job of keeping herself clean. I'm sure it's like that in the wild as well. They'll just hang out in the spot, poop where they're at, and keep moving on. So all in all, some of the most interesting animals that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. I absolutely adore all these anteater species. In the future, I would love to get some giant anteaters, but those guys need an incredible amount of space. They're huge when you see them in person. And um, you know, maybe in the future, we'll have some of those at the park here. But these guys, unfortunately enough, like as much as I want to keep everything I get, um, these guys are going to be moving on to other parks and zoos. Who knows? Maybe we'll keep the little creepy Muppet right here. Just maybe. Just because, you know, we don't get to see him too often. And who knows? Maybe we'll get a little boyfriend for her and we can be uh, some of the first to captively produce these guys and, and keep them kind of moving around and do a little uh, conservation through captive breeding type of scenario where people don't have to pluck them out of the wild or anything like that, and they can be captive born and bred, and we can get them just like that. But here we have a beautiful adult, a beautiful adult over there, a beautiful healthy baby, and I'm super excited to, you know, to have seen her eat at least something. It's not exactly the diet I want, like I said, but it's close enough for right now, and as long as she's feeding that baby, even if it's high fat content, I don't care as long as she's eating I'm a happy boy. So all in all, I think we're doing really well. We're going to get her outdoors. We'll do another video when we get her outdoors. And then we'll show you Kiwi's enclosure. We'll show you how she likes to spend her day. Well, you guys already saw because I showed you her shoved in the side of her nest box there. Good thing I spent all the time to build that. I could have just put a piece of wood up and she could have shoved her butt in the side of that. But that's her spot every single day. And Kiwi doesn't come out until about five to seven o'clock. Usually around five to seven, we'll see her kind of carting around and she's become amazing. I mean, she's always been amazing, but now it's to the point where when she's out, she'll come straight over to you. She's looking at you, she's looking for attention, she's hanging out and she's eating phenomenally and she's sticking to her diet. And we also give the treats, avocados every once in a while. We'll probably give her some mashed up, you know, papaya here and there, but that's just treats. And then the honey too. Let's see if this little guy will take a little bit of honey. Honey's like crack for these things. Oh, it's high sugar, so we don't want to give too, too much, but yeah, let's see here. You smell that? Just leave it just like that. Watch your hand, Kai. Watch your hand, Mama. Kai, where's that hand? This one's like too sleepy for to even try. Mm. Hey, tough guy. Tough guy. It's a girl. Okay, I get it. 
there's home or anything like that. See, I don't have a bet. All right, I'll let you go to bed. I'm gonna lay in bed on here. Watch this. Uh, I'll show you guys this time. They're sleeping. Yes, You're asleep already, Mama? Mm -hmm. oh, uh, he is. Look at her. She's. Milk drop. Baby's like upside down. Watch this. They never turn down this. Ever. Mm. Ant eater crack. Crack is whack. Don't do crack. I'm only going to give her a little bit, too. Get her sugars up a tiny bit. This is just as a treat. And this is exactly how we're going to slowly transfer these guys over to the other diet. Hey there, slow down. Slow down there, Captain Spanky. You want your other diet? Let me see if I can get your other diet over here. <clears throat> see if you want any more of this here. You want some more of this? Yeah, good girl. All right, all in all, I'm happy, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode, a little bit of information about these guys, and uh, we're going to do more. We're going to do more on these guys. We'll get a little bit more in-depth, so stay tuned. We'll do a part two. We'll keep you guys updated on these guys. We'll see if we end up uh, placing them at a zoo or if we get a little bit too attached and we end up keeping them here. We have no idea. We have no idea, but uh, we want to do big things. We want to do good things. We want to get people you know, with large parks, the ability to have these gorgeous, wonderful animals and happy and healthy ones where they don't have to worry too much. And uh, that's what we're gonna do. So stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. Things are about to get large and in charge over here with Bike Force and Cold-Blooded Kingdom kind of linking up, doing a little tag team match. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Patreon will be in the link. I figured that out. So if you go to the description, Patreon is in the link. The Facebook is in the link. Uh, the Instagram is the only thing not in the link, so that's bite force at underscore. But if anybody wants to join any of that, the Patreon, we're going to be slamming for the next couple of weeks. Within like two or three weeks, I find out we can do exclusive content. So we're going to have exclusive videos on Patreon for Patreon only. We're going to do the sneak peeks. We're going to do lives on Patreon. And then we might be bumping up a Discord as well. That's going to be in the far future. I got Josh, who was on the last live, that told me about that. And I think we can all interact together, like face-to-face, -face, and kind of talk to each other on the Discord. So that's going to be super interesting to meet everybody kind of like face-to-face -face instead of the comments. So stay tuned for everything. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you guys for supporting. If you hit the like button, I think it does something for the algorithm. I hate to tell people what to do. But if you want to smash that like button, go ahead and smash it like she's smashing this diet. And go ahead and like, subscribe, share to your friends, your grandmas, please. I love the grandmas. Flo, Flo, my Florida-grown grandma, she's going to be out there. I love you guys to death. Thank you. And boom.